Hello, my name is Gabriel Santos. Um, I am a paleontologist and I'm also the Director of Visitor Engagement and Education at the Alf Museum of Paleontology. Can we start with how you, were you always interested in geology and fossils? I mean, your bachelor's degree is in biology, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, as a kid, like a lot of kids, I liked dinosaurs and um, I always had a fascination with science in general, but I was not always interested, but not even that. I didn't even know geology was a career choice for me. Um, as you know, I'm Filipino American and kind of growing up with someone who loves science, the kind of thing that was given to me or, you know, influenced for me was I needed to become. <laughs> Sorry, one section. Roxas, hey, come here now. Roxas, can you be quiet for like a few minutes, please? No, he's like, oh, I don't care. <laughs> now that I'm on your lap. <laughs> for me, like I said, for me um, growing up, I was influ heavily influenced and suggested I should become a doctor um, because I love science. Um, and that's all I really knew going through high school all the way through my undergraduate degree um, in biological sciences. I was a pre-med and that's all I really had was like the singular mindset of like, OK, I guess I'm going to be a doctor. Um, but the thing that happened was that it, <laughs> there's construction, too. Um, the thing that happened was that um, I was not very happy in my undergrad. I. Uh, um, I just, I, I, I pretty much hated it because I just, I didn't have it. There was no challenge. There was no spark, I guess, in what I was doing. Like I did enjoy the classes and I enjoyed science. And I enjoyed learning, but nothing felt like I was heading towards something that I could see myself doing all the time. Right. Sure. It was great money and things like that, but it just wasn't, it wasn't for me. Um, and so along with, Unfortunately, being undiagnosed with a major depressive disorder at the time, I basically had like like a, a meltdown or, you know, uh, in my junior, no, junior, senior year, um, where I just was like, I can't do this. Um, and so I, I, I finished school and everything. I got my degree and I actually did do some applications for medical schools, but in really figure out my mental health and reaching like that very unfortunate low point in my life, I kind of realized I need to be like, I need to do something else that makes me happier. Um, and I actually didn't know what that was for like two years. So for two years, I just kind of tried different things. I worked for my parents. Um, and as I worked on my mental health too, um, and then eventually what happened was when I turned 20, uh, 23, I think my parents took me on a trip to the American Museum of Natural History. Well, actually, they took me to New York and I forced them to go to the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and so walking around that museum for a few hours, I ended up at the Paraceratherium or the Indricatheer, depending on what the current use is. Um, it's the giant rhino from Mongolia and it's huge, right? It's like, I think, 25 feet tall. And I remember standing under that exhibit for like 15, 20 minutes, just in awe of this huge, huge rhino. And I remember like, um, I remember thinking like, you know, someone found that, somebody had to research it and then someone had to create this exhibit, right? Someone had to tell this story. And for me, I think something clicked because I've always loved telling stories. I've always loved stories, right? I love movies. Uh, Star Wars is one of my favorite things. And I love Star Wars. I love, I also love talking about science. You can ask all my friends, who are not science majors. They're like, oh my God, Gabe's on another thing to tell us about this one thing. I asked for a simple question. I, I realized that's kind of what I want to do. I want to tell science stories. And I really like the idea of working in a museum. I didn't necessarily think paleontology at the time. So I came home and I just started looking for places to volunteer. Um, and then eventually I found the Cooper Center, which used to be affiliated with Cal State Fullerton. And at the Cooper Center, I started in the paleontology department. And I started doing a lot with the curator then, Meredith, I started working on fossils. I started doing SciComm, which was, you know, I started actually like creating content online. And then eventually they hired their um, faculty curator, Dr. James Parham, and he was looking for grad students. I was like, uh, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could do paleontology. 
And so after talking with him and doing all the stuff, he's like, you should apply to be my grad student. Uh, problem was I was a biology major. So I had to do a year and a half of like deficiencies before I could be a full grad student. Um, but eventually I did it. And then I became a grad student and I started to fall in love with paleontology specifically or, or re, re or find my love again for paleontology is more like it. And then um, within a year of actually starting the master's, the collections manager position opened up at the uh, Raymond Alf Museum of Paleontology. And I applied because I was just like, you know, it's always good to apply for jobs and practice, never really thinking I'd get it. And then, um, surprise, I got the job one year into my master's program, which was crazy and scary and everything at the same time. Um, but it was actually one of the best things that happened to me was because um, starting as the collections manager, I also was able to do a lot of science communication and science education in that role. And through all of that, I finished my master's after like five years. Um, but I also realized academia wasn't for me. I wasn't a huge fan of research. Um, it's not that I wasn't good at it or anything. It's just I didn't find the spark there. But I found that my spark was talking about science, sharing science and educating people. And so I started doing a lot more science communication, science education, again, cosplay for science, which we're going to later, go into later. And then um, eventually they hired me to become the uh, outreach coordinator. And then last year, no, two years ago now, I got promoted to the director of education and visitor engagement at the ALF Museum. So that's kind of my really long way around to get to where I am today. Our job is to interpret the clues of the world, right? The clues that are given to us to interpret, to interpret the story of the universe and the world around us. As paleontologists specifically, we look at the evidence of past life to interpret what life was like millions of years ago. And it's our responsibility to do that based, based off of the evidence, right? And share that with people. Um, of course, there's a little bit of imagination that goes into there, but as scientists, it's our responsibility to tell these stories that are, I, I don't wanna say true, but evidence-based, right? There has to be something there. And that's, that's where I was taught, my job as a paleontologist is, is to look at the evidence of fossils, look at, make sure we have good evidence, right? To make these claims and then share that with people to tell the story of the past. And so that, that, that's what I was taught a paleontologist is. And so I've done research on like marine mammal evolution mostly in the past. And, um, you know, that's stuff from describing, you know, life sequences of these weird marine mammals called desmostilians to describing marine mammal fauna based on fossils that we find um, in, in the fossil record. And moving from there to becoming a collections manager, a collections manager is the person who is in charge of a museum's collection, right? It's their job to not only just oversee, but like you have to be strategic in what fossils you are going to organize, what fossils you're going to um, to catalog what fossils you're going to work on for conservation. Um, it's kind of like triage, you know, you have to look at your collection as a whole and identify, okay, these fossils are needed by this researcher. These fossils are gonna break apart soon because they don't have the right housing. These fossils just came in, but they're in a jacket. They're surrounded by matrix. They can wait a little bit. The fossils that are needed by the researcher, the researcher's coming tomorrow. Okay, let's get those out. Let's get those cataloged. Let's make, make sure they're good to go. When they're done, okay. Now these fossils, they need a lot of work. They need some glue, they need to be rehoused. So that's kind of what you're doing as a collections manager is you're overseeing this big picture and being strategic to ensure that all your fossils in your collection are organized and preserved for future researchers. One of the things that I had to do as a collections manager actually was to develop our database. We switched databases. And so having to understand how a database works was really important for me as a collections manager. And then actually, um, helped me really in a lot of other aspects because I learned how to catalog and organize things. Um, it helped me a lot with like organizing some of like my comic books and like things like that, which was really fun. So like now I'm a collections manager because I do a lot of like Star Wars and comic book collecting. So now I can apply all those skills to my collection. Um, and then when I became a collections manager, that's a whole separate thing. I had to do a lot of switching of my brain in terms of what I was thinking and how I was strategizing things. Because when I was an outreach coordinator, my job was to figure out what stories to tell and how to tell them effectively and 
in a way that was engaging, right? Um, I think sometimes in our current scheme of things, people kind of just say the word psychom and just don't really have, there's like a, not a methodology to it. They think anytime you just talk about science, that's just psychom. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of components there, right? The science communication element is ensuring that you can take these really complex and connected concepts and explain them to those who may not have the connection or the lexicon to understand them immediately, right? So it's breaking things down. I don't like the word dumbing down. I like to say it's like, let's, let's break things down. Let's, let's, let's create analogies. Let's create um, personal connections to them. That's what you do as a science communicator is having people to getting people to understand and find these connections, not only between the concepts, but to themselves and ensuring that they understand. And then there's the education component. Education is skill building and critical thinking practice. You use science communication in science education. So I, there was a lot of that I did as a outreach coordinator in developing events and programs where folks can understand the concepts of paleontology and deep time and geology but do it in a way that they can build or have opportunities to practice critical thinking, build skills, but also have fun, right? Like if you're not having fun, I don't see the point in doing something, especially when you're doing education at a museum. For me as a director of education, my job is to create a strategic plan for our museum and say that, okay, not only am I creating these programs, but I have to be strategic in what are our goals right? Creating or doing goal setting and figure how these programs align and lead to our goals. So like for me, one of my goals at the museum was how can, or one of my goals was to develop a, um, or how do I say this? One of the goals was to develop more inclusive programming, right? Um, when I say inclusive, it's things like how do we create programming for those on the autistic spectrum? How do we create programming for uh, those who are blind or deaf, hard of hearing? How do we ensure that our museum is accessible to those with mobility issues who are disabled? Um, so that was one of my strategic goals. And so from there, I had to create a plan to reach those goals. And that include creating programs, but also like, what's our funding, right? Where am I going to get the funding to accomplish this goal? How much, not only that, but like, how am I going to strategically use this funding to reach the goal with the amount that we have. Because, you know, everyone knows science is already underfunded. Well, museums are severely underfunded. And as a small museum, we are critically underfunded. So, you know, trying to figure out how we can do all of that to reach that strategic goal and carry on that strategic goal for multiple years. As an outreach coordinator, it's not something I really thought about was how do I attract people? It was just like, here's the program. Hopefully people will come. But as a director now, I have to be like, how do I ensure that there are people coming so that we make, I don't want to say profit, but that we at least get, you know, something back out of our programming that benefits the museum as well. So, you know, it's things like, okay, so what is my marketing budget? What is, how am I going to do effective social media posting? How am I going to do community outreach to ensure that they know we have these programs available so that they do come to the museum? And that we get repeat visitors because if you don't get repeat visitors you it's not a good thing for a museum you always want to make sure you get those people coming back um so like there's a lot of different components that i have had to do that all revolve back to paleontology but as you can see like there there's a kind of a stepwise increase when it comes from the director from the education or outreach coordinator to director of education and there's a whole flipping of my brain in terms of skills when i was a collections manager when you have a pop-up museum, it's a cohesive story compared to when you're tabling. Um, you bring a few items and you're, you are kind of the exhibit when you're tabling, I would say, or like you're, you're doing a lot of promotion and you're, you're, yes, you're sharing information, but you're, you're more like doing promotion and outreach. When I do a pop-up museum, it's outreach, but there's also, there's also science communication. There's education component to it because I developed these again, this cohesive story that we can bring with us. So like um, one of the first pop-up museums that I remem remember doing was specifically about dinosaurs, right? 
So dinosaurs at the ALF Museum, because Dr. Andy Parkey, who's our director now, is an expert in dinosaurs. And we had a lot of holotypes and unique specimens at our museum. So I was like, okay, let's tell that story. So I created a little pop-up museum about some of the unique dinosaurs we had and also some general dinosaur concepts so that when they come and walk up, they're kind of getting that museum experience, but outdoors or wherever we go. Um, there's, there's little signage, there's interpretation, there are the specimens, but there's also elements of graphic design. There's elements of exhibit design so that it's appeasing to the audience, right? It's, it, it attracts them when they walk over. It's not just, here's a bunch of fossils on our tablecloth that you can look at, but there, there, there's a whole design aesthetic to it that I think may elevates from tabling to pop-up museum. And there are a lot of other museums and folks out there who do pop-up museums now at different scales, of course. Um, so I won't take credit for calling it that, but it is something that when I heard about, I kind of did it my way. Cause you know, I love graphic design. I love exhibit design. And I'm one of those people where like, I'm never ever just gonna take a bunch of fossils and put on the table. I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna make it look good too <laughs> because I have, I'm a little, I'm a little crazy like that. And I like to do things a hundred percent when I can. And that's definitely what led into uh, cosplay for science for sure was the doing pop-up museums. Um, the way it, what happened was uh, my friend and partner um, in cosplay for science at the Western Science Center, Brittany Stoneberg, uh, she and her museum had booked booth space at a small local convention called NerdBotCon in like 2017, if I recall now. And she's like, hey, do you want to come? Because we've done some other events together and she knows I'm, I'm pretty nerdy. And I was like, heck yeah, I want to come to a comic book convention. And then um, I was like, okay, if we're going to go to a comic book convention, we're not just going to go. We're going to like dress up and like bring this out because I was like, one, we have to like compete at a comic book convention with like all the cool stuff that's already there. But also it's like, let's have fun with it. There's a lot of cool connections in pop culture and science fiction and things like that, that draw on science and paleontology specifically. So what we did is we created a miniature exhibit of Jurassic Park, right? We brought fossils that of the creature, of the dinosaurs that you found in Jurassic Park. We all dressed up. I was Dr. Alan Grant. And uh, what we found was when we're dressed up and we have all the little nerdy aesthetic pieces um, and we weren't presenting ourselves as paleontologists or scientists from the start, people were much more inclined to come approach us and talk to us and stay there and engage with us because they found this familiarity with us, like, because they saw us as, as, fellow nerds and fellow cosplayers as something that was much more relatable to them than the science itself. And so we were like, whoa, people want to stay here. This is really cool. They want to talk to us and they're not afraid of us. They weren't afraid to ask questions. They weren't afraid of sounding dumb, which was really cool because we kind of broke that like barrier there. They, they just, they saw us as very friendly and approachable because we were cosplayers. And so when we realized that was like a thing, we started to work on it and have been working on it to make it this full methodology for us where we utilize storytelling, immersive exhibits, cosplay, um, and science education to create these really awesome immersive exhibits um, to engage audiences in science, but through the lens of pop culture. So we've done things like, you know, the natural history of Star Wars and our galactic archive the natural history of Pokemon. Right now we're doing um, the science of Dungeons and Dragons. So we have like this pop-up guild thing that we do. And the, the story is we are the tree fern guild and we are previous explorers and adventurers who now pledge ourselves to protecting the natural world. You know, while other guilds choose to slay monsters, it's our job to study and learn from them. And so we have like this, this really cool mini exhibit where we've collected specimens from throughout the forgotten realms and we dress up and we become our D and D characters. And again, we, we, we found people really love to sit there and talk with us when we, when they first approach us from that very nerdy perspective. Um, and we've, this is also a research initiative too. We have Dr. Lisa Lundgren at the university of uh, university, Utah state university. And she actually does um, the research portion. And so she studies, she observes us and studies our interactions with our guests so that we can develop a set of best practices. But we also have done a lot of surveys to understand how pop culture affects people's perceptions of science. 
Um, one of the cool things that we've started to see in our data is that there are a lot of folks who have interest in science who go to Comic Cons, but have actually not gone to a science institution, right? Whether that be a museum or like an ex a specific exhibit or even go somewhere that's like education based, right? They choose not to go there for many different reasons, but in, they still have that interest. And so we are actually reaching novel audiences. We, we hypothesize when we go to these comic cons. Um, it's still ongoing research, but um, it's fun. I really like doing pop-up museums. That's kind of like become my bread and butter. Um, it also gets me out of the office, so it's great. You know, there's so many factors out there that want, that either prevent people from going to science institutions or pro, or or chasing down like those threads of science, um, and even culturally that prevents them, right? So there's a lot of reasons that we're finding why people don't. And when we're reaching them, I won't even say we're reaching them halfway. We're just going to where they are. Um, and they have the lexicon because of science fiction. All we're doing is bridging those connections and showing them like, hey, there's a lot of stuff here that you like. Uh, like, you know, I remember this one guy, we did a panel about cosplay for science in general. Um, and we asked everybody, uh, tell, to go talk to a neighbor and tell them kind of what your favorite science subject is. And, you know, tell us about like a, a, your favorite connection to pop culture. And everyone did it. And then after the panel, this guy came up to us and he's like, I didn't really know what to say. I don't like science. I really hate chemistry. Um, but then you started talking about Full Metal Alchemist and which is an anime, right? And he was like, is there a way that I can, or he's like, I think, I think that I do like, I like Full Metal Alchemist and I, I think that means I like chemistry. I, I'm messing up the story in a way, but I was like, okay, I want you, I, I looked at him and I was like, I want you to tell me the full alchemical formula for a human being. And he went off and he was like, it's this percent carbon, this percent hydrogen, this percent nitrogen. And I was like, you just listed elements of the periodic table in percentages. You know chemistry, you know chemistry at the core. So I think you like chemistry. I just think you like it in a different way, right? And he was like, I guess I do like chemistry. And his face lit up and I was like, that was That's awesome. You mentioned the organization and database, you have a biology background, and then you had to fill in these quote unquote deficiencies to earn your uh, master's in geology. What would you say the skills, both technical and air quotes, I hate this term, soft skills are that you use the most in your various paleontology positions? All the skills I learned in classes, right? Like learning to read the rocks, sedimentology, um, uh, being able to read a map. Um, all the field tech stuff has come in handy when I'm in the field. Uh, being able to understand the time concepts, of course, was great. So like, of course, all the skills I learned in my geology classes are very, very important. Now, outside of those, some of the other skills from my, that have come in handy, one that I wish I had learned earlier was coding. <laughs> um databasing learning a database right is so important if you're gonna if you want to be in collections management management or anything honestly databases help you in all aspects of every career um so i wish i had learned coding so i could better understand our database and do it without having to like learn it myself um on the fly and have like a bunch of sleepless nights where i'm like watching youtube videos like oh, i don't understand sql um so that was really really important I think some of the other quote, like soft skills that have really benefited me. Uh, I took acting class, like in a couple acting classes in my undergraduate for my elective, just cause one, it was, I thought it was fun. And also my friend did it. And those acting classes and kind of improv really helped me as a science communicator and public speaker. Um, you know, like I've been able to learn how to just affect, com uh, communicate effectively. Also, uh, when I worked for my parents, I learned budgeting. <laughs> um, I think all scientists need to learn budgeting because you're gonna have a grant. So you gotta learn how to do that. Um, but for me as a director, having to manage the budget for all of outreach, that's been so, so um, important. I think communication and communication skills, learning how to talk to people, 
um, is so, so important because I, I sit on the board of our trustees at the museum as a representative for the museum. Um, and I have to learn how to talk to them who are our major donors, right? Um, I have to learn how to basically kind of play that game. I have to be polite. I have to learn what the politics are of the board. I have to know who likes what. I have to know how to talk to someone versus how to talk to another person because it's very different what I'm allowed to talk about, what their interests are. Um, it's very much playing that grand political game when you're in these kind of fields. And for scientists out there, you never know when that's gonna come in handy if you're talking to another board of trustees, a granting institution, even in your own inter interdepartment politics, you have to know how to navigate those things. And I learned those interpersonal skills on the job, but also um, because I was interested in bettering myself as an interpersonal communicator, right? I worked at Disneyland for the heck of it one after I graduated high school. And you know what? That taught me a ton of personal skills. You know, I would say that there is really never a skill in your life that you'll learn that just won't come in handy, right? In our field, especially, you know, you'll never know when something comes in handy. So like, just try things and practice them and they usually play, turn out for the best, right? Sure, okay, so my cooking skills may not necessarily come in handy as a paleontologist, but there was one time we were in the field and I needed to cook and I was like, actually I can do this and I was fine. So there are so many skills. I would just say, learn as many as you can that you have the ability to. We have so many opportunities between YouTube and you know Google, um, or Google University and Coursera and all that stuff. It's just been so amazing. Oh, I know another one. <laughs> I don't want to call this a soft skill, but for, for a lot of folks, when I learned um, curriculum design um, from National Geographic, I took the National Geographic certification. Uh, that came in handy as an educator because um, you need to learn. You can't just create a program and be like, okay, great. There are so many things. You have to understand audience. You have to understand the, the purpose. What skills are they going to need? Uh, you have to understand um, uh, assessment. That's the one thing I think so many science communicators and science educators, I want to—I don't want to say lack. They just never had the opportunity, I think, for a lot of them to learn that. But if you're not assessing and critiquing your own programs to know how you how the, how effective they are and how you can grow on them, I don't think you're doing a good job. Cosplay for science. That's that's my baby. That's my that's my current like main project I do. And like I said, what it is, is we, it started as a group of four paleontologists specifically. Um, funny enough, we all are Titans <laughs> from Cal State Fullerton. Uh, and we are also nerds. And when we figured out that there was this way that we could bring science to Comic-Cons, but also make it engaging and immersive, right? It's not just, we're scientists at a Comic-Con. We are pulling at the threads of science that are inherent in these science narratives and reworking those narratives so that the science is more evident and people are able to utilize that and practice critical thinking skills and make broader connections to science in their favorite pop culture narratives. So that's kind of what we are at our base. What we do is one is we create our pop-up museums themed around different pop culture uh, franchises and stories, IPs. Um, like I said, we've done one for the natural history of Pokemon where we brought fossils that's, that, what were stand, that were the same ones that inspired fossil Pokemon and other Pokemon in, the, in that world. And we were acting as professors from that world, right? So uh, we do a lot of immersive storytelling there where we are the characters. We invite our audience to come in into the world and we talk about these science concepts, but from that world's perspective. Like when we do our galactic archive, I'm not paleontologist Gabriel Santos, I'm Jedi Master Gabral Zonto of the Galactic Archive. And I talk about the many different aliens that are found throughout the galaxy and the different types of planets. And then we talk about planetary geology, ecology, evolution. We've talked about um, adaptation and you know all these different anatomical things. But again, from the perspective of Star Wars, the fossils and natural history specimens we bring in are stand-ins for these aliens. And when there we do that, it's so that people can 
have fun again find that relatability to something that they like and again we are I don't want to say hiding but we're blending in we're weaving these narratives of the science with the pop culture element so that people can learn without realizing they're learning because again like I said before was a lot of folks have this interest in science but they have no interest in going to a science institution or finding science themed whatever so what we're doing here is we, not tricking them but we're showing them like here's cool star wars stuff but while you're talking about star wars let me weave in some science elements so that we can start getting your critical thinking, um, get that critical thinking going. So if they can learn and practice critical thinking, learn how to ask the right questions in fictional settings, they're, they're subconsciously learning how to do that, to ask questions so that when they go off into the real world, they practice it and they're learning to do, they're just learning to do it because it's natural to them, right? Again, we're, we're, we're a research initiative too. Um, we really, really want to understand how the impact or how science fiction and pop culture impacts people's perceptions of science and scientists, because those perceptions affect the way that they engage with science in many different levels, what classes they want to take, what institutions they want to visit or whether they don't, even what decisions they may make when it comes to things like voting, purchasing recyclable items what they've learned in pop culture, whether or not it is wrong or not, or it's a misinterpretation or a, something like that, that affects it. And so we are trying to really understand though that's the, the strength in that connection. And then with our best practices that we are understanding how we engage with our audience, we can fold that in and alter those perceptions without having to remove people from something that they love without having to tell them that it's wrong. I'm going to, I'll start off by saying there is no path, right? There's no, there's no predestined path. There's no like stepwise, you do this, which will lead to this, it'll lead to this. That, that doesn't exist. Everybody's going to have their own unique path and needs and troubles and timelines. Like I said, my master's took me five years. So, cause I was figuring it all out. I'm still figuring it out right now. I'm 35. Um, but my advice was to just let the force guide you, right? Like if there's something that you find interest in and you like it, follow that for a little bit and see like, does this work for me? And then if it doesn't, it's okay to shift and go to another thing. And then while you're doing that and practicing, find a community of support, right? Find and reach out to people who you think will help you. Try out different things, and if it doesn't work, that's okay. Pivot, try another thing, and eventually it's going to lead you to where you need to be. And find a network of support. Find community. Find mentors. Find advisors who not only you, when you talk to them, you get to know them, you feel like they will support you, but also are working on the things you want to work on. One last thing I will say is be kind to yourself. Um, this is, we're paleontologists, we're geologists, we're whatever we choose. It's a career, it's a job, but it's not who you are, right? Who you are is the person who, what you do when you're not in school, what you're doing when you have a bad day, what you do when you are going to cry because there's so too much to do at work. So instead, you're going to sit down and you're going to watch 10 episodes of Star Wars just to feel better. Yeah, take care of yourself because you have just the one you and no job, no career, no degree is worth sacrificing yourself for. Yes, work hard, like work hard. There, there's gonna be people with privilege, there's gonna be people without privilege, so we're gonna work harder than others, but still just take care of yourself, take care of your mental health. If you need a break, never feel guilty for needing to take a break. And if your advisor makes you feel bad because you need to take a break, maybe that's not the advisor for you. So...